All right, then. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let's call today's meeting to order uh, at uh, 9.01 by my clock. This is the December meeting. Donna, can you do a uh, roll call, please? Uh, Director Brown? Present. Director Downing? Present. Director Dutra? I'm not seeing him. Uh, Director Colin Terry Johnson? Present. Director Koenig is absent. Director Lind? Here. Director McPherson? I thought I just saw him. Okay. Uh, Director Myers is absent. Director Pegler? Here. Director Parker is absent. Director Rockin? Here. And ex officio Director Henderson? Here. And ex officio Director Northcutt? Here. And I just saw Director Dutra come Here. online. Very Jimmy. good. Morning, Jimmy. And anyone else I missed? There and there, Director Sorry. McPherson just came online. Here. Yeah. Thank you. And we do have quorum. Very good. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Um, announcements. I'll note that today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. And with that, any comments from our directors? Uh, yeah, Mr. President, I just want to say um, congratulations and thank you to uh, Michael Three and especially Donna Bauer for having a great uh, Christmas party for our employees at the Elks Lodge. I attended, it was really well done and much appreciated by members of our, our team. So uh, it was a really well done and much appreciated by everyone there. I can tell you that I talked to, it was great. That's thank great. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Mike Rockin. Uh, good morning. I'm happy to have been uh, reappointed by the Board of Supervisors, County Board of Supervisors to the Metro. If those of you who followed this uh, saw that there were a number of uh, people from the labor movement who opposed my reappointment. And I just wanted to say that um, I plan to make it a, a serious effort here to reestablish the good relationship that I've had with the unions for the over 30 years that I've been working on the transit board. And I'm gonna do my best to make that happen uh, because I think it's really important that we recognize the contributions of our employees and their representatives in the unions. So I just wanted to make that comment this morning. I'll be meeting, try at least attempting to meet with both groups and uh, see if we can fig figure out how to reestablish the confidence that they at least used to have in my uh, performance here. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any other comments from our directors? Seeing none, let's go into oral and written communications. Uh, we've gotten more than a dozen already in the packet, and I know Donna distributed one last night from San Jose State. I hope everyone's had a chance to see. Yes, all that. Has there been anything else, Donna, that's arrived overnight? Not this morning, no. Okay, and with that, I'm going to go to uh, the public for a comment. I want to note, Donna, we're going to have a two minute clock. Is that correct? Correct. All right. And looking to the list, I see Carrie. Let's start with you, if you. Try now. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Do you have the presentation up in front of you? Uh, give me a moment here. Uh, I was told there was a three minute time. Uh, I had understood it to oh. be two, but. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you, Larry. Uh, uh, there is a three minute. Oh, it's three timer. minutes. All yeah. right. Okay then, three minute timer. There you go, Carrie, we're getting the clock fixed. I mean, he apparently had a presentation of some kind, which we don't see yet. How about now? That's true, if the clock is running, can we see the presentation? Um, all right, let me try. Donna, you may need to just warn him when we're at a minute or at various I'm points. I'm having a, uh, okay. Uh, 
All right. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay. okay. And Donna will warn you at different time points. Okay. Is that good, Carrie? Uh, looks like oh. Carrie, are, are you muted again? There. Uh, yes. Yeah, she just, there she go. had muted, somebody had muted me. So let's, let us start now. Yes. Uh, please. Please go to the next page. It's, the title is just transportation topics. And this is really meant to be, there's lots of information that is not being passed along. So there are 228,000 vehicles that use Highway 1 daily, not 100,000. Half of the ones that come through Watsonville actually come from Monterey County. That's something that most people don't understand. That changes the whole conversation on bus versus train versus car and highway expansion. And when you look at Watsonville, the ones that would work, uh, that would take Highway 1 North, almost half of them take Highway 17. So they're not all heading towards Santa Cruz as they like to talk about. Only 22% go to Santa Cruz, 30% go to the Mid-County. Uh, when you look at the fish hook, about 50 to 60% of the traffic actually takes Highway 17. And by the way, those aren't all Watsonville people, that's just all traffic going there. So there's so many misstatements on how traffic is done. And all this, again, this affects how you plan buses and trains and automobiles. And lastly, I'd like to point out that the new Highway 1 project, if you look at it, it costs 15 million per mile or a little under. Next one, next slide, next slide. Uh, so now you may think that trail facts don't affect you, but actually it sucks the oxygen out of the room on focus on transportation and uh, uh, transportation projects. So the smart rail trail itself costs 2.7 million per mile uh, for 21 miles. And here we are in Santa Cruz, we're so focused on this rail trail stuff that we're willing to do anything. So the segment nine, uh, first of all, the plan brings up concrete CO2 emissions to such a point where it's 6 million car miles. When you pour all that concrete, it would take 32 years to recoup that in terms of the number of bicyclists. Segment seven costs 5.3 million per mile, and that's because it's on level terrain and it had a few street crossings. That's why it's more than 2.7 million. Segment seven, phase two, is uh, near the Neri Lagoon. That's at 17 million per mile. And now let's get to segment nine. Uh, that is at 30 million per mile. It's, you have to separate it. And then lastly, I'll get to segment 10 through 11 is 18 million per mile. But when you separate it out, segment 10 itself is 30 million per mile. Next one. So compare that with the highway. That's half, half um, double the cost of a highway, let alone a trail. So here's my conclusion. Watsonville commute is not driving, is not driving the issue on Highway 1. It's 50% of the traffic coming from Monterey County. Santa Cruz is not the focus of commuters in general Highway 1 North contra, uh, traffic. It contradicts RTC statements on the need for a train. Uh, this is what everybody should push for. They have cell phone origin destination data in their hands or at least access to, they've paid for in a previous study. And that's the way you should analyze commuting data. And then lastly, constructing a trail on non-flat terrain is terribly expensive and more than a freeway, the CO2 emissions outweigh vehicle emissions and it sucks all the energy that you could do for fixing treat, uh, streets um, they should be focusing on metro buses and funding all that stuff. And lastly, I'd like to say is the sources that I get all this information from is from not my data, but Caltrans, U.S. Census Bureau, uh, Sonoma Marin Rail Transit. And actually, one thing I don't have on there is the Monterey Public Works as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, the next hand I see, I think, is Brian from Trail Now. Brian, are you there? Brian? Brian now. I'm on good now, thank you. you. Yeah, this is Brian, thank you for the time. You know, your organization really is a, a leading, uh, like a business in the sense of transportation investments and how best to serve your customer. And, and really need to focus as a business does on factual data. And Carrie Pinko 
uh, just shared with us very good factual data. And we're very fortunate to have a person like Carrie who, who takes the time to get this data and tell us about the data for Highway 1 traffic flows. Uh, you know, and he also pulled up the information about 28 past rail studies since 1977 have existed. Now, are you sharing my, my photo of Park Avenue and the railroad? I know it's in the package, so I won't wait if you takes time. But you can see from the, the photo that these rail lines are on the cliffs. They're 20 feet from the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. And those cliffs might not exist in 2024. The California Coastal Commission will not prove any fixed rail system on this cliff. They've already rejected three past Santa Cruz County requests. Carrie's facts on cost of the trail really makes us understand how we need to, you as an organization, have to really focus on what's the best investment. When we're paying 20 million a mile or more for a trail, a, a narrow trail, versus what it should be, which is 2 million a mile, we need to step back and, and just understand why we're doing that. The other factor that people don't really think about is the federal railroad guidelines, which requires the separation of a fast moving train from a trail by 20 feet, 25 feet. You can understand why they do that is because it's very dangerous. If we have trains flying 60 miles an hour along Park Avenue, we have to separate the trails. And what's going to really make it so the California Coastal Commission will not approve a rail on that Park Avenue throughway is the fencing that will, will be required to prevent, that will prevent access to the beach. So we're, we're asking you to support the good investments. Look at the facts. We're, again, very fortunate to have people like Carrie doing that real data look. And we're asking you to take consideration of those facts over emotional decisions and, and public opinion. So thanks again for your time. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the next speaker I see is David Loves Public Transport. David, are you there? Right now. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, go ahead. Oh, good morning, great. Hi, this is David Van Brink. Um, so uh, yesterday morning, we woke up in Yosemite National Park. Uh, this is a great time of year to go. And over the course of the day, we took uh, five buses and a train to get door-to-door -door service uh, all the way home here to Santa Cruz. It's so much nicer than driving and definitely cheaper than renting a four-wheel drive kind of thing, which you would need to do uh, this time of year during the snowy season. Uh, one of the first buses still in the park did have a mechanical problem. You know, I've been asked, oh, you like public transit so much. What happens when the bus breaks? You know, and the answer is, well, it's just like when your car breaks, except you don't have to do anything. Uh, I will mention that the last two buses, the Metro 17 and 18, were both exactly precisely on time to the minute. You know, bravo, but it meant we had to wait exactly 29 minutes for the next uh, 18 bus to the west side. I know you've got a lot of uh, moving parts to manage. Uh, but really, here at the end of the year, I just wanted to say thank you for making our transit work. I know you have public polling that says people like it, but I also wanted to say it clearly. Um, I'm an actual user and thank you for public transit. Uh, lastly, I wanted to pass on a question from a friend, which I hope is actionable. Uh, she says, I really like the bendy buses, but why do they only bend in the middle? Couldn't they be bendy the whole way? So maybe look into that. Thanks and Happy New Year. Thank you, David. All right, my next I see is Brett Garrett. <clears throat> right now. Good. There you are. Good morning, this is Brett Garrett. I want to speak very briefly about transit on the rail corridor. Um, it's not obvious to me how a conventional rail transit system is going to coordinate with the metro system because the rail corridor doesn't go anywhere near the exi existing transit stations in downtown Santa Cruz or Capitola Mall, um, nor does it reach Cabrillo College. So I want to share an alternative vision 
of transit on the rail corridor to address these issues. It's called RailCat, and it would use small vehicles to provide on-demand travel. This means an extremely convenient system that can be easily extended to serve the transit stations in Cabrillo College directly. RailCat is designed to keep the railroad tracks in place so that they could be used for freight trains running during off hours. Um, and it's also fully compatible with the existing rail trail that is already being built. The infrastructure would be very similar to pavement with railroad tracks like Chestnut Street in Santa Cruz. Um, the RailCat system could provide 24 hour service except when freight trains need to operate. The RailCat system could be metro managed by Metro or by some other authority, whatever seems appropriate. It's based on very narrow, narrow vehicles that have already been created. These vehicles actually exist. Um, they're a company called Glideways is testing these narrow vehicles at Gomentum State Station in Concord, San Francisco Bay Area. And they also hope to build a system using these vehicles in San Jose. Um, please keep an eye on what's happening in Contra Costa County where the Transit Authority has recently issued an RFP to build a system somewhat similar to what I'm proposing for Santa Cruz County. They already have a vehicle, um, I'm sorry, they already have a feasibility study based on the Glideways vehicles, the same ones that I'm suggesting to use here. The RFP is broad enough that it remains to be seen what will actually be built in Contra Costa County, but the plan is for an on-demand system, very similar to my proposal. The main difference, um, one difference is that they're not dealing with a rail corridor, um, but they will probably have very high ridership because their system will be serving three BART stations. So please keep an eye on that. Um, we need an innovative system to meet the needs of Santa Cruz County. Yes, so I urge you to take a look at uh, railcat.org for a detailed explanation of the system I'm proposing. Again, the website is railcat.org. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brett. Uh, Donna, are you able to mute the other the previous speakers before we move on to the next? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, I see Tiffany Rodriguez, colleague from San Jose State. Tiffany. Unmute you. Okay. There Hello. you are. Hi, Tiffany. Hi. Um, so thank you uh, for the board. I hope you've reviewed my letter and I'm just here to speak, you know, to you all directly to talk about all of the, um, you know, concerns we've been receiving. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of San Jose State um, regarding this change to the Highway 17 Express ending at Duradon. Um, I myself live in Watsonville and oftentimes use the Highway 17 Express as an alternative. And I will drive to the Scotts Valley Park and Ride. And like many other people, even though I live closer to Santa Cruz or other areas where there I could potentially catch the bus, it just doesn't compare to um, you know, the Scotts Valley Park and Ride where it's very safe, there's lots of parking, and it makes it really easy for me to utilize that service like many others. Um, as you all know, the um, 17 is extremely dangerous and a lot of people don't feel comfortable driving on that road, especially with the heavy rain. I myself look for alternatives because I just don't feel safe. Um, and I think, you know, making this additional transfer at Duradon is really gonna make it difficult for people to wanna take transit. And with all that we've seen with the, the pandemic, losing ridership and the challenges it has had on restoring ridership, I really want you to recon reconsider this um, because I think it really goes against some of our goals. And you know, we have the same goals to get more people on transit and make the road safer. And um, I really hope you consider this and the things that I've written in the letter. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Let's see. Uh, next, I see uh, Terry Graziani. Terry, are you there? There we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Terry Graziani. I'm an employee of San Jose State. I've been riding the Highway 17 bus since July 1st, 2008. 
I use the Scotts Valley Transit Center because that's where I have to go to be able to get home. There are people who ride the Highway 17 bus who are regular working people in San Jose State, Mondays through Fridays. They live in Scotts Valley. And this new schedule doesn't allow those of us who get off work at 5 p.m. to get home. We can't get home on that 5.30 bus that leaves the Deridon. It doesn't go to Scotts Valley. Our other choice is to wait for a bus an hour later and then possibly not get home till 8 p.m. at night. Um, my big ask is, just as Tiffany's, keep going to San Jose State. My second ask is, have all the buses go to Scotts Valley. I know not a lot of people get on and off there, but enough do. You stop at a lot of other stops where only one or maybe no people get on and off. Keep the Scotts Valley open to us. We really, really need it so we can get home. Um, and my other ask is for this new temporary, hopefully temporary schedule, have one or two buses in the morning and one or two buses in the evening that all serve Scotts Valley and can get us to work through the downtown San Jose corridor to the campus because there's other people who get off along the way and can get us home also. Have the, have the morning bus end at San Jose State, have the evening buses start at San Jose State. Um, and then the rest can just do the Derridon thing. That's my idea. But there are students who take night classes and maybe there'll have to be maybe one bus later in the evening to help those students out. Because I've read this correspondence and I'm very concerned about the two students who said, I take night classes and now I can't get home. So please consider all, our, all your writers, not just the majority, consider the minority also who ride the bus every single day. Thank you. Can I can I ask a question of this yeah. uh, speaker, uh, Larry? Go ahead, Mike. Um, I, I take your points, all of them, um, and I definitely somebody who understands that um, having to make a transfer is a disincentive for taking public transit. I think that's a strong argument for us to not make any of these changes permanent. But my my question is: Isn't it possible for people the one of one of your points um, to use the VTA system? Uh, leaving campus to get to the bus that still leaves from um, Deirdre Station to get back to Santa Cruz, or am I I'm misunderstanding the situation? Yeah, that that's been told to us, but um, I've had I've known people who've done that in the past, and then it's not super reliable. If I'm if I miss a bus to get home, I'm kind of trapped and stuck for another hour. No, I and my biggest concern is not being able to get off in Scotts Valley and get to my vehicle and go home. And all right. of all of us who, who live in a place where Scotts Valley, some of these people live in Scotts Valley. Some of them live up Highway 9. What are they supposed to do? Can't get home. If, no, you, I, go I, look I took, at that, if you go look at that new schedule, you'll be like, wow, if I worked in San Jose and got off at 5 p.m. and I have to get off in Scotts Valley, how do I get home? No, I take your point about the Scotts Valley stop. I, I was asking yeah. a question about the other piece of this um, around whether people could get back um, at all onto the Highway 17 Express service um, using the VTA. Yeah, there's plenty it, it, of VTA buses and options, but... No, your yeah. other points are well taken, and we, yes, we obviously will you. be taking those under consideration. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, the next I see is Joe Martinez. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Joe. Okay. Uh, my name is Joe Martinez. I live in Aptos, and I just want to take a moment to uh, ask you to, to listen to what Brian Peoples has said today, and that you sh uh, should uh, make your, uh, that I support uh, Brian and Carrie uh, with the information they're provided and to use it, use that information to make your decisions. So that's all for now. Okay, thank you, Joe. You bet. All right, the next hand I see, I believe is Greg.
Greg, are you there? Now. There we go. Maybe. Or did we lose? There. Greg, are you ready? Yeah. Can you hear me? There you go. Hi. Um, I'm a Aptos Seacliff resident, and my understanding is there's a possibility of making a demonstration trail um, on the line. So uh, at Seacliff at uh, State Park Drive, there's the rail line runs just up from Marianne's Ice Cream and goes all the way to downtown Aptos um, and is actually being used right now by pedestrians in an ad hoc fashion to walk from that area to downtown. And, and it also goes by Rancho Del Mar, the shopping center. So I was hoping to make a case for having a demonstration trail from State Park to downtown Aptos. Number one, because it's already being used. But number two, and more importantly, there is absolutely no safe bicycle corridor to get from that place on State Park Drive to Rancho Del Mar, the shopping center there, or especially to downtown Aptos. You have to go over a freeway overpass, um, which is scary, um, both uh, on ramps and off ramps. Um, and then into the Rancho Shopping Center, which is uh, problematic. Um, but if you want to continue on further into downtown Aptos, you have to go over the bridge. And the bridge is not built for um, bicycles at all. Um, very unsafe. Um, trying to take your life in your hands uh, doing it. So that section of the, of the railroad converted into a demonstration trail would be used very heavily to um, both by locals and during the summertime by um, visitors to get from the popular beach there to downtown Aptos. Um, and it would be a great place to have a demonstration trail to see what an actual bike trail uh, conversion of the rail would be like. Um, the other um, uh, component of that is that people, like I said, are already already using it. And if you look at the topography there, there is no way to have a rail line run concurrent next to a bicycle trail. The width of the bridges that the train would be going over would require uh, that the bike trail go back onto surface streets. And surface streets there are, as I said, very dangerous. So. Um, I just wanted to make the case uh, to if there's a possibility of having a demonstration trail to have it there, it would, it's already being pretty heavily used. It would be magnificent to connect those two spots in Aptos um, as to what the trail could be. Um, thank you for hearing me out. Larry, can I make a quick comment here? Yeah, you're probably beating me to it, but go right ahead, Mike. Um, Greg, you, you should contact the Regional Transportation Commission. That's the agency that actually controls that rail corridor and makes the decisions about, and some of our members serve on that board, so it's perfectly appropriate, you know, fine for you to speak to us, but I think your comments are best directed to the RTC that actually controls those kinds of decisions rather than the transit district. Uh, my apologies then for- uh, No, no, no need to apologize. I mean, as I say, we, we have some interest in this, I'm sure all of us, but the, the, we don't make the decisions about the use of that corridor. That's made by the Regional Transportation Commission. And you can just Google RTC dot, just uh, Google RTC Santa Cruz and you'll, you'll find it. Thank you. Uh, my apologies. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. That was the clarification I wanted to make. We are, we are the transit group, the public transit in Santa Cruz County. Uh, the next speaker I see with a hand up is Ryan. Uh, whoops, where did it go? Uh, Ryan Saranato. Sorry. I don't know if I got the last name right. Sorry, Tom. I can't see the last name. Saranataro. Sorry Thank about you, Ryan. the long <laughs> last name. Uh, yes, I, I live in Aptos um, and I'm very much a supporter of the idea that transit includes a uh, something more than uh, motorized vehicles uh, and which means bicycle infrastructure, which is difficult in this county. I, I think it's important uh, that the public be provided proper information about about transit in the county and the, and the presentation that Carrie Pico made is is kind of data that is just hasn't permeated the public. And 
Um, the county has just recently received a, a massive grant for building within the rail corridor. I understand this is not your purview, but uh, the sometimes political logic just seems irrational from a citizen's point of view. So you have a hundred million dollars that you're going to spend basically industrializing the rail corridor, taking out hundreds of trees, causing immense amounts of greenhouse gas emissions that will never be recovered, and leaving future generations these massive retaining walls that are actually going to be a hazard, especially you take 100 years from now or 200 years from now. What's the world going to be like? Those walls are still going to be there. Um, I'm very much an advocate for expanding the freeway because of the flexibility that's allowed. Now, I end, again, political logic says you got $100 million from one fund, you can't move it to another fund. Um, and the $100 million that's essentially going to be wasted, or most of it is going to be wasted, is of a, a benefit to all kinds of people who receive that money. And so there, that's where that logic is. Anyway, my kind of bottom line point here is that I would love for boards such as yours to infuse more clarity and rationality into the public discussions about the options for our money and what our future can look like. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. The next speaker, uh, Buzz Anderson. Okay, you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Buzz. Uh, yeah, I wanna thank Kerry for his uh, presentation on the cost breakdowns of the rail trail. Uh, it was very enlightening. And uh, just make a quick comment on the relationship between uh, Metro and the rail corridor. And I just wanna state that uh, any planning for a train and building an expensive trail offset from the tracks it will invariably take money um, and resources away from Metro. And it's happened in other communities as well. I just want to emphasize that uh, Metro is the future of mass transit in our county. Thank you. Thank you, Buzz. Next speaker I see is Barry Scott. Maybe Barry's hand just went down. Um, Good. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, but I oh. see Shannon Miller now. Sorry, Donna. No, that's okay. And I think we still have Buzz turned on. No, I don't think so. Hello? Hi, Shannon. There you are. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I work at San Jose State and I wanted to underscore and thank Tiffany for a very, very carefully done letter that articulates many of the concerns we have, um, both about discontinuing the bus from San Jose State to Diridon and for cutting so many, even more of the buses stopping and starting at, stopping um, at uh, Scotts Valley. I, I wanna speak to the Scotts Valley thing where I think you, you, you do have a lot of sympathy for the issues around that. There will not be parking at Paso Tiempo if you cut off the Scotts Valley stop as much as the schedule, uh, schedule uh, new schedule imagines. Um, but it is, a, uh, it is a transit center. And the point of transit centers is that you, you put in significant parking, you provide a safe environment and that bus is stopped there. So for people who get um, having to get to Pasatiempo, if, for example, they're taking the 35 to get there, how is that going to work? But the point of a transit center is everything stops there. So it's, I second Terry's points about those who live in Scotts Valley needing to be able to do it, but as she underscored, it's people from throughout um, the San Lorenzo Valley, up nine, et cetera. Secondly, the idea that you can catch another bus is in fact true, but that catching of the bus has time problems as Terry mentioned, and you're going to lose a huge number of riders because 
you know, everybody knows and all the studies show that when you add that kind of transfer, you make it much less appealing for people to continue using public transportation. It's just at that, that point easier to hop in your car and do exactly the counter thing to what we want to have happen right now, which is to have more people using public transportation. So I just think it's really important to remember the ridership will be stronger if it continues to San Jose State and it will support uh, us uh, lowering emissions across Highway 17. Um, and my colleague, uh, uh, Audrey Shillington, also wanted me to mention that uh, it does feel significantly safer to be able to hop on the bus at San Jose State than try to get to a Deer Don after dark in the middle of the night, et cetera, when there are a fair number of people around there that uh, can, can pose some threats. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon. All right, the next speaker I see is Maura Leonor. Maura? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Here you are. Go ahead. Good morning. How are you doing today? Thank you for Pretty being well. here. Hi. So my concern is, um, well, first of all, my name is Maura Leonor. I work for a nonprofit here in Watsonville that we serve uh, North and South County and Mid County. Um, we work with uh, developmental, um, we do, I am do employment development and independent living. So we use, uh, we serve our community uh, and with disabled adults in South uh, County and we ride Metro and Paracruise system. So we, we work with our clients and our clients family also ride Metro. So on occasionally we do have to call and we have to do some complaints about how the Metro system works and things that go wrong. However, um, today I did want to express um, about a disappointment that I have and that I'm disappointed about uh, how we reelected a board member that was already serving on the board. Um, we did want to reelect a third person that would be uh, serving our, our board here in Watsonville to represent us here at Watsonville. We were hoping that would happen. Um, so we, we didn't get that and we really, would really, really wanted that to happen so we can have a better representation of how our community would be represented, but, you know, we didn't get that. And what we wanted to do is what I wanted to say is that we, we needed, uh, new thinkers with new ideas. Um, our County is being deprived of that. Uh, we just wanted to have. Give me a sec. We wanted, I wanted to say that we are underrepresented and we have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read my paper. Our community needs a board to have a better balance of inclusive representation and uh, somebody that knows our community. So we were hoping we could get that with uh, Daniel Dodge, but you know, we did. We didn't get that and we were hoping that you guys were would give us that with a third person um lastly there's two changes that have been done with metro and they took two routes away from us and now it's going to affect students it's going to affect seniors and it's going to affect our disabled community to get to their doctor's appointments to school um basically to uc and to cabrillo college so we're we're wondering if those can get changed back. Um, we don't know if that's going to, if the reason is basically to save money or why. So thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for your comments, Mara. Mm -hmm. uh, the next and the last hand I see is from Barry Scott. There, thank, uh, thank you for, uh giving me another shot. And uh, my name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos and I'm a 
an avid supporter of, of public transit and bike and anything that gives an alternative to cars. I'm a member of Friends of the Rail and Trail and an active participant in the Coast Connect campaign, uh, which is envisions a, the ability to get around without owning a car, period. Uh, and to do this, we need uh, bus, bus and rail and more bike lanes. And I just, I wanted to call in with just a, a, a statements of gratitude uh, to Metro, to all the commissioners and the Regional Transportation Commission and recognize accomplishments of this community and these com commissions uh, for 2022. We just heard that we received $115 million from the CTC to build segments eight and nine of the rail trail. Uh, that's significant. It's the largest ever uh, grant to uh, active transportation project ever. Uh, the RTC's commitment to rail transit planning, finally, uh, the right thing to do. We bought the rail line specifically for that. Uh, the defeat of Measure D in June is, is, is important so that we can remember that 73% of the people do not want to remove rail from our future. And I'm very grateful for new leadership at Metro. Um, and, and this is, is to Mr. Tree, but also all of our all of our commissioners. But uh, Michael Tree has expressed a wish, uh, a dream, a, 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 I don't even want to call it a dream, a goal to double ridership. And that's exactly what we need to do, double ridership if, or better over time. It's going to take time, but it takes vision like that. It also takes a rail line, I think, because with the, the rail line serving as a backbone, and I need to remind people that uh, many bus trips, many transit trips require a transfer. And, and sometimes you have a backbone and the rail line would be a traffic free backbone with on, on time arrivals and departures. And some people would be served with just the rail line with stops and others might take a transfer. But between uh, the rail line as a backbone along with uh, with a uh, 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 shuttles and, and other bus routes that uh, coordinate with that and the trail, we can have that car-free future. So congratulations to all. It's been a great year and let's keep going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. I've seen one more hand come up from David Tran. David, are you there? Try can now. you hear me? Yeah. Yes, there you are. Hi, how you doing? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, good morning, board members. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak and for all that you do. Uh, my name is David Tran, and I am with the City of San Jose's Department of Transportation. Um, our director had co-signed the letter that you received from San Jose State University, and I am here to echo the comments that have been made around the upcoming changes in the winter service, specifically around Highway 17 Express. Um, we strongly urge the board and transit district to reconsider the change of having the uh, Highway 17 Express stop and start at Duradon Station. Along with San Jose State students, we have a number of employees, including City of San Jose employees that take the Highway 17 Express. The City of San Jose has set ambitious goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions caused by commuters driving alone. The Highway 17 Express provides a crucial service to city staff, downtown employers, and San Jose State students and staff that supports these goals. Uh, having a service that continues to extend to the San Jose City Hall and the university and doesn't require a transfer is key to the success of the service. We don't see uh, the, the transfer as redundant service. We know that where there is a lack of seamlessness in a transit trip, it also negatively affects passengers' experience and consequently reduce ridership. The City of San Jose's uh, Department of Transportation understands there may be operator concerns with stopping at City Hall, and we are happy to engage and under understand better those concerns and explore resolutions so that we can maintain this critical route as is. We hope you will take our comments under consideration and thank you so much. Happy holidays. Thank you, David. Uh, let's see. Oh, I see a hand from Equity Transit. Imani. Should be. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Equity Transit would like to appreciate the work that Bus Metro Board and the staff and Mr. Tree are doing. Um, looking forward, uh, we wanna appreciate your quick responses as the community is experiencing you know, various levels of discomfort with temporary changes and growing pains as you continue to work to hire more drivers during a long period of being shorthanded. 
I would like to also speak to the importance of prioritizing robust public transit for our community as a system of systems that looks 100 years into the future. With close to 74% of our county voting repeatedly in support of passenger rail that will connect us to the state rail network being planned now, that uh, will connect us to, from Santa Cruz to Monterey, Salinas, San Jose, San Francisco, and beyond. Our community has worked for over 20 years to bring passenger rail to life for our community. Our working, uh, our essential workers spoke up loud during uh, the Greenway Measure D campaign, opposing Measure D, people like our nurses, our police, teachers, um, elderly people with disabilities, our underserved community members from Watsonville, all in support of passenger rail. Equity Transit supports a strong busing program and a future with passenger rail that will serve so many more in our community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And I believe that was the last public comment. Um, before I bring it back to the board, I'd, I'd like to ask if John Ergo from our planning staff has any additional information that he might share regarding the, the winter service schedule and uh, plans. John, are you able to, uh, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So I'll, I'll be brief. I, I first want to just acknowledge that we understand the impact that these changes are going to have on, on our customers. Uh, the We looked at adding the 5.30 p.m. trip back to Scotts Valley uh, this bid. Uh, unfortunately, it was on a piece of work where the operator is working 11, an 11 hour shift five days a week. And by contract, we cannot extend beyond 11 hours. So we couldn't add even just a 10 to 15 minute extension uh, to serve Scotts Valley on the 5.30 p.m. trip. And that really just highlights the strain that operations is under, uh, given that we are facing a severe operator shortage like many of our peers in the transit industry. We're currently 20% uh, below our pre-COVID numbers, and this this is what's driving the temporary service changes that we've had to put in. Our temporary, and we've taken all the public comments, we've responded, and uh, the next service change will be March 16th. Uh, as I mentioned, we're already planning to add the 5.30 trip back to Scotts Valley. Um, and on the uh, Watsonville on the 91X side, uh, we also hope that will be a temporary change um, and uh, I, I just want to say that throughout COVID, uh, we've actually added service to Watsonville. Local Watsonville service is 8% more today than it was pre-COVID, and that's due to the addition of the Watsonville circulator. If we take into consideration the, the inner city routes, the 91X, 71, 69s, they're about 10 to 15% below pre-COVID, but that compares to UCSC that is over 30% below pre-COVID and Highway 17, that's around 30% as well. Um, so we've been prioritizing local service and local service in Watsonville throughout this process. It's a difficult situation that we're all in, and I would just urge the public to bear with us as we continue to try to hire operators and get to where we were pre-COVID. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Directors, any questions or comments? Not seeing any hands, so I think we will move on. Our next item, is there, uh, what do we have here? Let me change my computer. Uh, James Sandoval, hello, good morning. James, are you there? Try now. I can you hear me. Yes, yeah. there you are. Well, there always seems to be a delayed option to unmute myself, so apologies for that. Okay. Um, hi, James Sandoval here, General Chairman of Smart Local 23, who represents the bus and paratransit drivers here at Metro. Uh, a couple of items I want to speak to. First, uh, the Christmas uh, event party that we had at Metro. It was a great event, and I um, was glad to see a board of director make it, and I'm hoping to see more of that where uh, we all get together for these type of events and um, credit to Michael Tree. I know he tried to give me full credit for that, but um, I honestly think that was our idea, not just mine. 
Uh, another thing is I wanted to say congratulations to Mike Rockin. I know we uh, highlighted a few issues that we've had in the past, but um, we really wanted to put a spotlight on the real issue uh, where there was a lack of representation on Watsonville. And I know that got diluted. Um, but, you know, when nine out of the uh, 11 board members rep represent mid to North County and only two for Watsonville, that is a real issue when Watsonville has about half the population size in Santa Cruz County. So um, I just want to reiterate it was not personal, and I'm glad to hear um, Mike Rock and say he's going to make an effort to where we can start working together because uh, I will do the same. Uh, I will always answer the call and have meetings because uh, we need to continue working together not just for ourselves, but for our community. They rely on us uh, to work together so we could continue uh, providing reliable public transit. And uh, the third thing is, as John Ergo mentioned, we are um, lacking uh, or we're understaffed for the bus operators and we do need help. So anyone here that's still on that mentioned problems with modifying the service, um, our operators are are stretched to as thin as they could be, and we need help. And uh, the quick solution to bringing most of this back is finding us more operators. And we are recruiting for more operators right now. I believe the applications um, uh, process closes January 7th. It is a great job, um, and I highly recommend it to anybody, whether it's yourself or family or friends. So please get the word out there. Uh, you can apply online. Uh, we need the help. Our drivers are strained. We uh, we need more people here, and so um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thanks for the, uh, the bus operator pitch. We need more operators. Um, but, next, but, th th thank you, James, for your comment. This you. is Mike speaking. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next item: Do we have any communications from the Metro Advisor Committee? Uh, there are none. All right. Thank you. Any additional documentation to support agenda items? Uh, other, other than what I already sent to you, no. Great. All right. That brings us to the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda that uh, directors care to pull? Or do we have a motion for approval? Move approval. I'll second. second. You know, I just wanted to make uh, one comment on non seven. It's great about um, the consideration of uh, to execute the, the contract amendment uh, for the battery operated electric buses. Uh, we're, we're on we're on the right track, literally. And I thank you for this board and uh, this district. Uh, we're doing our part. So uh, keep on moving. So I appreciate that very much. Good comment, Bruce. Thank you. Um, that was a, I didn't catch you the motion and second word. I made the motion, Donna. Donna, and second was? I was one of them. There's so I think Mike and I tied, so. <laughs> All right, we have a motion. Give, a give it to Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy was the second. See, Mike gives to South County. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's the holidays. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's have a uh, roll call vote on that, please. Director Brown. Aye. Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson? Aye. Director Lind? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. And Director Rockin? Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. That brings us to the regular agenda where I have a lot to read, I believe. Uh, presentations of Employee Longevity Awards. And we have Oh, wow, we have 12 people who are celebrating their 10th anniversary with Metro. And uh, I'm going to read brief bios on uh, many of them. So bear with me and I hope my voice holds together. First is Crystal Ayers. Crystal started her career with Metro as the bus operator, was promoted to a transit supervisor, and recently to the position of safety and training coordinator. Crystal served in the US Air Force, and is possibly Metro's only employee that has a license to fly a helicopter. She is a talented artist and enjoys her time off with her dog Snoopy, husband, two children, and caring for her very happy chickens. I love that. I think I'll just keep going is that, if that's appropriate for folks. Pablo Berleza, Berleza. Pablo started as a bus operator and promoted to a transit supervisor. He's been in charge of scheduling operators daily work and his knowledge is valuable to operations. 
He also served in the U.S. Air Force and was stationed in Little Rock, Arkansas. He did three tours in Iraq, and we are proud of his service to our country. Pablo enjoys traveling the world with his family during his vacations. Next is Lorena Calderon. Lorena is one of those operators that always has a smile for all her passengers. She always comes to work with a positive attitude and an infectious laugh. Travis Havens, along with performing the duties of his job as a bus operator to the best of his ability, Travis also approaches gardening in the same way and is always generous with his amazing produce. He always makes the best out of every situation when he is out on the road and goes out of his way to make sure his passengers make their connections. Next is Allison Hernandez Adair. Enjoys her conversations with her passengers and takes pride in her customer service. She enjoys the outdoors and hiking in state parks on her time off. Next is Joan Jeffries. Grew up in Southern California and came to Santa Cruz in 1996 to attend UCSC. After graduating and working for many years as a paralegal at Seagate Technology, she realized she would rather be in a service-oriented environment and applied to Santa Cruz Metro. She began working here in 2012 before purchasing was even its own department. Joan's duties and responsibilities grew throughout the years and she became manager of the purchasing department earlier this year. She's very thankful for everything her career at Santa Cruz Metro has provided her. She resides in Felton with her partner of many years, along with their TW cats, maybe that's two cats, Puppy and Chewy. In her time outside of work, Joan is co-owner of an independent record label, and she recently edited a book about the Yippies and their agitprop, ad, agitprop? protest actions of the 1970s. Obviously, I should read it. Next is um, Herman Lopez. Uh, Herman has enjoyed a career as a bus operator and is a new father. He's an amazing baker and enjoys his time off having fun with friends and family. Bear with me, we have a few more here. Michelle Martinez. Michelle is the perfectionist on the job. Her passengers can count on her to get to work on time. She enjoys her time off with her husband and daughters. Oscar Mendez. Oscar starts every day as a bus operator with a positive attitude. He's ready to work any shift for as many hours as needed. He's a hard worker and never lets anything bother him. He spends his time off with his wife and new baby. Next is James Sandoval. James is a Santa Cruz County native. He started his career with Metro, unaware that his grandfather was also a bus operator for Santa Cruz Metro. James takes pride in his position as bus operator and as union chairperson representative for all the bus operators. He enjoys his time off with his wife and two children. Next is Roberta Valdivia. Started his career as a bus operator and now enjoys the challenges of supervision. Robert grew up in Watsonville and has extensive knowledge of the area. He enjoys spending time with his family and helping with the family apple orchard, especially during harvest season. And the last individual we want to recognize is Michael Thorne. That's 12 folks who are celebrating 10 years with Metro. So I'd suggest a hand. And let's see, that's a, we have a motion. We need a motion for that. We want to appreciate these. We do not need a motion on, oh, on that good. item. All right, thank you. Just a presentation. And that's probably true for the next one too, Donna, or retire. Uh, which no, I wish to point out that these, they also get a small uh, cash benefit from this longevity awards. And um, let's give credit to the union for having bargained that longevity award it, it's not something that i mean we we i don't think anybody on our board opposed it but it it uh it, the union was representing its members well and they and when they fought for that recognition that it, it makes a difference to us to have people that stay with us for a long time and that's why we have that award that's very good comment mike and here's to the next 10 years for all of you i hope um all right then i think Donna, the next thing I have are the retiree resolutions of appreciation. Yes. And 
I have one bio I'm going to read for that, and that's for Rhonda Carter. Rhonda has always been involved with the Santa Cruz community, and it was only fitting she became a bus operator in an area that she was born and raised in. Her customers know her as the driver with the flower in her hair. Rhonda always looked out for her passengers by making their connections and helping Metro provide courteous, safe, and reliable transportation in an atmosphere of mutual respect and cooperation. Her favorite holiday is Halloween, and she would take the opportunity to show off her amazing costume designs while driving her routes. She also had a hand in organizing a flash mob dancing to Michael Jackson's Thriller in downtown Santa Cruz. That's cool. We wish her luck and happiness in her retirement. And also retiring is Eileen Wagley, for whom I don't have a retiree, but hand for both of them. So and we no do need a motion on okay, that one. Okay, very good. I thought so. So I'll we need move, a motion. Move, move approval of the motion of the resolution. We have a motion. A second. We have a motion and a second. All right. Was, roll call. Uh, you... Was the second Director Downing? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank All you. Right. So roll call vote, please. Director Brown. Aye. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Lind. Aye. Director McPherson. Are you muted, Bruce? No. Okay. Um, Director Pegler. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. I'm sorry. Aye. I, oh, I, there I, he is. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. All right. Our next item uh, is consideration of an award to Jarrett Walker and Associates. Um, I think John Ergo. John, are you presenting this item? Yes, sir. I'd like to share some slides. So I'm going to share my sure. screen. I hope everyone can that. Yeah. Great. Very good. Uh, good morning, directors. John Ergo, Planning and Development Director. Uh, so uh, in October of this year, Metro advertised and distributed a request for proposals for the bus network reimagining plan to, 70, to 1,700 firms, including disadvantaged business enterprises. Uh, and in the RFP, we outlined uh, four key project outcomes, which I wanted to uh, share with you all before we get into the award. So, okay, the first uh, is an evaluation of Metro's current fixed route system. Uh, so in other words, a comprehensive analysis of all of our routes and schedules. As some of you uh, on the board will remember, the last Metro completed its last major service restructuring in 2016 on the heels of a fiscal crisis that led uh, to close to a 10% reduction in service and a 10% a commensurate reduction in ridership as well. Um, and you can see this on uh, this historical chart of ridership and revenue uh, hours over the past 20 or so years. Um, much has changed since that time, uh, including a worsening housing affordability crisis in the county, increasing congestion on Highway 1, uh, growing demand from UC Santa Cruz, and most notably, the lingering impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has altered uh, travel patterns, perhaps irrevocably. And uh, this slide just blows up the last uh, two years of ridership and revenue hours as we've gone through the pandemic uh, and, and started to come out of it. The reimagining plan is necessary to help us have a conversation about uh, how we're doing and where we go from here. The second key outcome will be a uh, an engagement with the public and a network planning exercise through a presentation of two or more alternatives that illustrate difficult trade-offs uh, in transit planning. The trade-offs are difficult because they require balancing important goals that cannot be pursued uh, with the same dollar. There's no right answer, uh, but the purpose is to help people understand conflicting transit goals and imagine how different their transit system could be. And often the, the alternatives will be displayed as a ridership goal versus a coverage. Um, and this is the discussion we wanna have with the public. 
This helps ensure that we're asking the public to give us actionable input because they can see a network, they can see how uh, changes might affect how they're current, how they currently use Metro and how they might use it in the future. And when people are asked to react to networks that illustrate competing goals, they are waiting, they are weighing real trade-offs that Metro must make today and in the future. Some of this work we've already begun. Um, as you'll remember from the board retreat uh, in October, we presented a survey um, that we had completed that month of a thousand adult residents of Santa Cruz County. And the survey revealed a strong preference uh, for changes uh, to, the transit to the transit network uh, in favor of frequency over broad availability with, neither, with nearly 70% of respondents preferring that Metro provide fast and frequent service that comes every 15 minutes and takes the most direct routes, even if that means transit is only available in areas where the most people live and work, versus providing service to as many places as possible, even if that means the bus only comes every hour or two. And currently, Metro has no service that operates 15 minutes or better throughout the day. Also through the survey work, it was revealed that nearly half of non-riders, which is astounding, uh, would likely ride Metro more if service was more frequent. Um, we'll, these we shared in October, along with some other questions that we asked in the survey. And we, if the board approves this uh, planning effort, we'll be doing additional survey and focus group work as part of the reimagining plan process. The third key project outcome consists of draft and final network scenarios matching three possible financial projections, one with current resources. So really looking at, are we providing the best service we can with our current dollars that meets the community's goals? And two, with additional resources. So envisioning um, future service expansion uh, possibility should additional resources become available. On the plus side of this conversation, at least in the present moment, Metro is not staring down a fiscal cliff. We have a little bit of runway to imagine a future where we don't have to make service cuts and perhaps we can even expand service. And this will guide this will essentially establish a blueprint as we work with the Regional Transportation Commission and AMBAG uh, to identify corridors and operational needs for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. The fourth key project outcome includes a robust process of interaction with stakeholders, city councils, the Metro Board, and the public that provides opportunities to provide substantive and impactful impact to the plan throughout the process. So this will carry uh, throughout the next 15 months uh, and make sure that we're meeting people where they are and casting a wide net. The other uh, piece that's driving this are the five-year strategic plan goals that Metro CEO Michael Tree uh, presented to the board at that retreat in October. Uh, the first is our ridership goal, which is 100% increase within the next five years. We need the network reimagining plan to envision how we get there. The second piece is our commitment to purchasing only zero emission buses moving forward, converting our entire 96 bus Metro fleet by 2037. This network reimagining plan will establish what our future fleet needs are and where that service will be operating. Uh, it'll also tie into the South County uh, zero emission operating base um, that we presented to the board before. Uh, the first step in establishing uh, the planning for that base is figuring out what the service looks like uh, in Watsonville <clears throat> County in Santa Cruz. And finally, on the affordable housing piece, while we will not be addressing that specifically uh, with this planning effort, um, it will guide future development decisions throughout the county as we identify which quarter, which corridors uh, will be operating more frequent service. Um, so as I mentioned, we released the RFP in October, uh, November 3rd, uh, proposals were received and opened from three firms. A list of these firms is provided in attachment A. Uh, we had a three-member evaluation team composed of Metro staff from admin and planning and an outside advisor uh, from Monterey Salinas Transit, who just last week implemented their bus network reimagining plan, which was a two-year process um, that got them to a, a pretty comprehensive uh, service network update, uh, again, implemented a week ago. Uh, and Jarrett Walker and Associates was determined to be the highest ranked firm whose proposal fulfills the requirements of the RFP with costs that are fair and reasonable. Staff is therefore recommending that the board award a contract to Jarrett Walker and Associates for the bus network reimagining plan in an amount not to exceed $398,106 and authorize the CEO general manager to execute the Jarrett Walker and Associates contract 
funds to support this contract are included in the planning department's FY23 and FY24 professional and technical fees operating budgets. And were the board to approve this award, the project would begin uh, right away in January 2023 uh, with the first phase of outreach, the alternatives process scheduled for the summer of 2023. The second phase of outreach, the draft planning process scheduled for the fall winter of 2023 and the final phase and adoption of the final plan anticipated for spring 2024. I'll just uh, wrap up by saying that I think we're all here in this Zoom room uh, because we believe Santa Cruz County has the potential to support an excellent transit system that visibly contributes to goals that matter to many in our community, including livability, equity, access to opportunity, and reduced emissions. There's a lot that needs to be done to improve transit here in the county, like better infrastructure, zero emission buses, and improvements to the rider experience. But what will make the most difference is how useful the transit system is for people to get to where they need to go. For example, how do we make it likely that when someone looks up a transit trip, they will find a reasonable travel time? The design of the bus network contains most of the answers to that question, and this process uh, will get us there. And I'd be happy to take any questions if there are. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, John. Uh, questions from directors? Uh, Rebecca, go right ahead. Yeah, I just have a comment, John. Thank you so much for working on this. And um, I really appreciate the presentation that you made and the goals that you uh, described. I, I happen to live in a place where if I get on the bus in Seacliff that, and I run the little app, how do I get to Aptos Village? I can't actually get there on the bus. That's just one example of one person in one neighborhood. And there are some other neighborhoods in Aptos, like La Selva Beach, which we're well aware of. They don't even have service. And so while I appreciate the ridership coverage challenges that are especially acute during our driver shortage, I'm looking forward to seeing this project um, really engage communities and actually listen to them because we want, we want them to participate, but they won't if they don't feel like they're not being heard. So I just wanted to um, mention that. And also, uh, I first uh, saw Jarrett Walker speak at, at the RTC uh, at a workshop there. And uh, there is a video of his presentation there. It has to do with transportation in the area. Some of you may remember participating or, or seeing that. And after I did, I, um, I visited his website for his company. And he also has an area called uh, humantransit.org. So I did a lot of reading there. And actually, prior to and when I was appointed to this board, uh, I went and read more of it because there's a lot of information about like, well, now you're on a transit board. What does that mean? What do you do? And so I'm really glad we selected them because I think that they have in-depth knowledge and I'm looking forward to seeing what they have for us. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> also more of a comment than a question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to know uh, that the county and the city of Santa Cruz will be revising um, the housing, their housing element. So very, very relevant to the goals that we've set uh, at the Metro. And I think um, can be, hopefully we can integrate what's happening with the county housing element and the city housing element with this reimagining plan. I think there's a lot of overlap there. So that's the comment. Thank you for the work. And if um, when appropriate, I'm happy to move this item. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I see your hand up. Yeah, I'll make my comments now rather than after the public speak. Um, but I wanna reinforce what both Rebecca and Shebra had to say. Um, Jared Walker's firm is the preeminent uh, um, transit planning firm probably on the planet. And it's a lot of money. It's not chump change. It's a lot of money we're spending for this planning process. But I'm glad we've selected the group that we did to do it. I think they really will give us the kind of quality product that is worth that money. Uh, it really will affect our goal of being able to double our ridership um, uh, over the next several years. And the on the housing issue, one of the things that wasn't pointed out by John in detail, but we're planning to build quite a bit of housing, um, almost about 150 units, I think 175 units on our property, uh, transit property in the county. But 
a much larger number of housing units are impacted by the, the uh, question of the frequency issues along the major corridors, so along Soquel Avenue, for example. And we need to work closely with the city and the county, city of Capitola, um, to um, make sure that we, we take advantage of the housing opportunities along these major transit routes. Um, it, we really can make the housing more affordable by not requiring as many parking spaces if people really have a, a serious transit alternative, a bus that runs, it, for example, every 15 minutes or so. Um, it really can make a difference to people actually using public transit. And in developing these, what I'll call them corridor plans, it's critical that we address the design issues that uh, neighborhoods around, uh, behind Soquel Avenue uh, on both sides of the street um, are, uh, have con these concerns that they have about this. I and mean, as you can't, nobody wants to live in a single family house with a five story wall up against their property line. So obviously designs have to shade down the, the properties in the back. And there's a whole series of design issues that really need to be taken seriously and designing this housing. So there's a lot more affordable housing, but it's compatible with the existing neighborhoods rather than a, something they're gonna come out and, and as they have in the past, fight tooth and nail and destroy the possibility of it actually happening. So our, our, our transit efforts really need to be coordinated well with the, the housing efforts of the various governmental agencies along these routes. I wanted to thank John for his presentation because I, these are exciting goals for us, I think, in the coming years. Very good. Uh, next I see is Jimmy. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Larry. Um, I just wanted to say also, um, I think this is a really great idea to, you know, include a lot of voices throughout the county. I, I, I definitely agree with this. And um, I do want to say that I appreciate the support um, that our new chair has been giving South County. I know that um, I feel like we, this is the most attention that we've had in a long time. And I know that um, when we had, <clears throat> we let, we met not too long ago with the board, I know that they also have a commitment to um, South County and the, and a new facility down there that um we are um trying to find space for so i appreciate that and and also to talk about the the housing and um, um we've been having conversations about you know building housing on our property in south county uh you know um with a our our uh, bus station down down on the base bottom and then going up several stories to create housing and this is a conversation we're having that looks like it's going to be coming to fruition so um this is really nice to uh be um uh, getting this attention down in South County and, you know, addressing the needs that we have as, as there as well. Um, and so I want to say thank you. And I look forward to this moving forward. Very good. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, looking to the public, uh, James, I, James Sandoval, I see your hand up. I don't know if that's from previous or would you like to comment on this? Might be hanging on from a while ago, James. Yeah. All right. I see. Uh, Equity Transit has a hand up. We'll go there while we check on James. Lonnie. Hi. Hi. Uh, Equity Transit is excited to hear that Jarrett Walker's consultation services are being considered for award given his national and international work and his decades of extensive work and expertise. For people unfamiliar with his work, as Commissioner Downing just mentioned, um, we recommend you check out his webpage, his book, and a video of his live presentation to the RTC in 2018 here in Santa Cruz available online. We support Jarrett Walker as the choice for this work to move bus metro forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, checking in on, I've lost my pictures here. James, are you, uh, no, James took his hand down. Yeah, I took that. Okay, I see no other public comments. I'm bringing it back yeah. to the board. Um, Chevra. Jeffrey made a motion, sorry. Sure, yeah, I'd like to move the staff recommendation to award a contract to Chair. I'll Parker. second it. So we have a motion from Shebra, a second from Jimmy. Any further discussion? Questions? All right, let's uh, have a roll call vote, please. All right, Director Brown. Aye. Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colontary Johnson. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. And Director Rapkin? Aye. And the motion passes. <laughs> all right. I hope uh, all of us will be uh, engaged over the next couple of years. This is going to be a, a wonderful and challenging task. 
positive outcome to come from it. Next item, um, do we have a report from uh, Michael today or is we do. Don, uh, Don's going yeah. to step in for him? Thank you, Don. No problem. And I will go quick. I know everybody's anxious to, to um, come out. So forgive me if I read too fast. <laughs> Um, so an update on the Celtis contract, um, the newly contracted marketing firm Celtis that was approved in December by the board was just onboarded this past week and has hit the, boat, the board, um, hit the road running with some brand initiatives. Over the course of their contract, uh, contract, Celtis will assist with marketing support, brand development, creation of a photo video library, social media, and an implementation of a new website. So that's exciting. One ride at a time campaign update. Metro's marketing department has been making great progress on our one ride at a time campaign. The campaign in partnership with Go Santa Cruz has created a customer, a customer loyalty program that will in incentivize riders to use the system by making a donation to one of two of the local um, environmental nonprofits, the, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the Bay of Life Fund. Metro plans to unveil the first two bus wraps featuring land and sea photos from National Geographic photographer Franz Lanting at his Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History Gallery opening on January 21st. Marking plans to update you more about the program and the event in January. Um, an update on grants. Tis the season for grants. Metro is currently working on the TERSIF grant. This is a $40 million grant at the state level for hydrogen stations and buses and improvement of the Watsonville Transit Center. Um, Arctic buses. Metro is in the process of acquiring 10 Arctic buses from San Diego MTS that are 10 years younger than our oldest fleet. And this will help bridge the gap for when we order hydrogen and when we actually receive them, which is um, can take up to two years. Um, an update, um, thank you, James, for your shout out for recruitment on bus operators. I appreciate all of that help um, because we are down bus operators and, and, and need a lot. <laughs> so we currently have six new hires in our training class. Um, they're slated to finish sometime in late January and hopefully be on the road soon after that. We are also currently running another recruitment so that we can have a new class start right behind this one. And that recruitment is running um, on the radio ad right now, KSCO AM 1080 and FM 104.1 and 95.7. Um, this radio ad also can uh, includes testimonials from our current bus operators. Um, the recruitment runs through January 7th. Um, and we are also um, looking for mechanics. We currently have two mechanics on deck to start on January 11th, and we're looking for four more. And then to close with um, something fun that's already been mentioned, but I want to um, send shout outs as well for our holiday party. Metro had a holiday party last weekend and it was a great turnout, even with the rain. There were approximately 115 people in attendance. A very big special thank you to Bruce McPherson for his attendance and help with greeting employees as they arrived. And a huge, huge, huge thank you to Donna Bauer for putting the entire thing together. Um, the decorations were beautiful. The hors d'oeuvres were great. Um, Donna did uh, dedicate many hours in putting this all together, and she really did a wonderful job and deserves a hand. Thank you. Yep. Very good. That concludes the CEO report. Terrific. Thank you, Don. Any questions? Uh, I see Mike's hand. Don, I wonder if you could take just a moment to explain some of the benefits of um, uh, be working at Metro as a bus driver, maybe if you, I don't know if it's on the top of your head, but the starting salary, which is paid while you're being trained, um, and yes. uh, you know the benefits package and those can just give to in case there are members of the public listening that are not aware of what it is that we, uh, the compensation package that's available for bus driving in this county. Sure. So we are currently hiring at step two, um, which is 2458. So we're starting them at step two instead of the, the training wage that we were bringing them in on before. So they're starting at that wage. Um, we are also offering up to $4,000 higher on bonus as well. Um, in addition to that, we're offering a $2,000 referral bonus to our current employees for anybody that refers a bus operator or mechanic position at this time. Um, that, that also includes paratransit. Um, the medical benefits is, is wonderful. Metro pays 95% of whatever plan that the employee chooses. Um, we pay 100% of the dental, dental um, the vision. Um, we also have life insurance that we cover. We have the CalPERS pension um, that we have. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anything. Those are the, those are the, the most major um, 
Um, we also have longevity that you mentioned earlier. Um, sorry, off the top of my head, I think I covered. No, that that's that's great. That okay. gives people some idea that we're not Absolutely. just we're not just hoping people apply on the basis of like we need them, but it's also it's a good job and um, and well compensated, I think, and and that's our hope to try and reach out uh, effectively to people in the community to take this job. Absolutely. Very good. Any other questions? All right, Don, terrific. Thank you for that. I believe I'm going to move on to announcing our next meeting, and that will be January 27th, Friday of 2023, into a new year. Um, with that, I wish you all a happy holiday, and we'll adjourn this meeting. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thanks. Thanks, Larry. Great job chairing again.